and I am now recording the session. Might you give Monica the co-host to let people in while while we wait to begin? We'll begin. Yeah, let me find Monica. Where are you? Don't see Monica. Oh, there you are. We co host. Good. Okay, Monica is now co host. And let me make Roberta host. Host. If the only person who is not um, on right now is Ed. I don't see Can you make uh, Lucy co host as well? Yeah, she already is. Okay. No, she's not. She's not? Mm -hmm. I thought I did. Oh, I know what happened. Sorry, Lucy. Okay, she is now. Right now. She should be. All right, good. So all the jurors are co host, as is Monica. We should be good to go in five minutes. Where's Ed? Got him, I'll get him. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, Warren, how are you? Good, how are things in Texas? Very Texas-y today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Uh, Ed, you, you should know there there there's lots of people listening to us right now probably so we're the we're the warm up that's okay yeah it's very um, how, are, uh, how are things in uh well georgia. In yeah exactly exactly i'm in georgia usa and everyone else is in europe mostly i would assume although i bet we have a lot of new, a lot of usa and asia as well it's gonna be this exciting is, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing <laughs> we're about to try i'm so excited to try this thanks well, for being part of it my pleasure and uh i know a lot of people are really keen to uh you know to talk about what the opportunities are right now um because there's such a demand and need for good content for children yeah, Ed, you actually wrote a wonderful piece about uh, sort of a preview of all the digital options at, at Bologna, which I, I put a, as a, li a resource link. Excellent. There's a lot going on. Uh, Bologna is doing a really good service by facilitating this, especially opening it up to, to as many people as possible across the world at a time where people are really isolated and, and trying to figure out what, what comes next. So. Yeah, and this is this is a um, the least worst option. The food isn't quite as good, but we are gonna we're gonna make do with what we can here. I know, but I, I'm I'm really missing um, the camaraderie. Yeah, the whole Bologna feel. Exactly, it's, it's pretty cool. I know, and no aperitivo online, but that's all right. <laughs> no, but I am famous for for sneaking limoncello into to my panels, and so um, it is 
10 Wait. 30 a.m for me so it's a little early i'm gonna have to stay with coffee oh i recognize all these people <laughs> yeah i'm really starting to see a lot of friends and it's great i ed i see you you wore your red shirt good we know where you are I, I we have denmark I, axel i see Good yes. to see you. That's awesome. So one more minute, we will begin. The registration's topped a thousand people from my understanding. Is that right? Yeah, it's um, just over a thousand and we don't know what will happen. I've never hosted or done anything this large on Zoom and I do see our, uh, the director of the fair, Elena, who's on right on schedule. So this, I think this is going to work. I, <laughs> I think this, work. <laughs> <laughs> it better work. Um, you can do a digit. We could do the first ever digital wave. <laughs> I'm stopping share so people can see our faces and then I'll start us up again. Um, Okay, but, but here we are. Lucy's waving. I think she might want to say something. Here we go. All right, so now you see the start screen again. So it is, it is um, exactly time to start. So let's begin. Uh, Co-moderators keep letting people in. We're going to try to blow up Zoom and the internet this morning. That's our objective. <laughs> um, but I, I um, am very happy that we can, we can pull this off with technology. And thank you all for being pioneers, involuntary pioneers in this. Um, to, to begin, I would like to uh, ask Elena, um, the fair director, if she would um, like to give us a greeting. I cannot speak. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? We yes. hear you. Well, well. So, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, the exhibition manager of the Bologna Children's Book Fair. Uh, you know, you see, we have. Uh, created this uh, special online edition in a few weeks uh, and uh, we have uh, done our best really to put together all the different uh, aspects, all the different features uh, of the fair and um, I think we made it. Uh, we have uh, created a platform for the right exchange uh, that's uh, for the exhibitors and the, the, uh, the visitor agents and publishers. Then we have created our own museum, our own gallery, our gallery, that's BCBF galleries for all our exhibitions. And then we have uh, quite a, a program of events. And of course, this is uh, the feather in the cap of the program because I'm amazed uh, to, to see so many people, more than 1,000 people all connected together. So you, you can see that it's true. Now everybody says uh, far but close, far, we're far but close. We are definitely. And then it's amazing to see from how many countries you all are connected. So I'm, I'm really so, I'm delighted to see all this. And I'm also very happy because um, we have been working uh, for a long time on, on the digital uh, uh, for uh, children and uh, of course uh, it's a book fair but uh, it's a book fair that had paid attention to the digital uh, developments since the very beginning. We've been working together with Warren for uh, some 20, 30 years I think. We got started in the 90s to work uh, on the digital. We had uh, an ebook award early in 2000 when it was absolutely too early and uh, now uh, here we are and uh, i'm so I'm, I'm i've been pleased to see how 
also the traditional publishers have been, has, have been challenged in the last year, especially by the um, uh, virtual reality, the augmented reality uh, into books. Uh, the cooperation uh, with these uh, digital technologies uh, with the traditional books. So I think um, there's uh, plenty to work on in the future. I think that we're gonna see more and more developments. I'm very grateful to Warren, to Neil, to all the jurors of the Bologna Ragazzi Digital Award, and I wish you all uh, a nice meeting here all together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Elena. It, and um, I'm now going to jump back to our slides here and give you a brief overview of what we have planned. Uh, this is our agenda. We're going to try to keep it uh, about an hour in length. We'll see how it goes. Um, we're going to begin with uh, a, a short presentation of the uh, jurors of the Bologna Ragazzi Digital Award. Uh, Roberta is on, Lucy's on, and Neil is on, and what we discovered this year to give you some overall trends. And then we're gonna have a question and answer session with uh, Ed from Publishers Weekly, who's on with the bright red shirt. And we'll see where that takes us. Um, we're, uh, I'm sorry, I'd like to add, because I forgot to tell about, uh, thanks for the slide, that uh, this program uh, is, uh, is uh, in the framework of the ALDUS uh, European project. And uh, this is not something that I want to add just in a formal way. It's very interesting because actually this uh, network of international firms is, is a really very meaningful and it's doing a lot of stuff and it's uh, amazing to be in the framework of this project because this means that we are also connected today that we are talking all together we are strictly connected with so many other affairs in in the european countries that uh, will bring uh, um, more and more sharing some more and more connections in the future so this is not just uh, meant to be okay it's in the framework because uh, it's an european project and it's a, a, a kind of uh, plaque that we can show now this is a real connection and real cooperation among the fairs wonderful and elena i'm going to leave you uh, unmuted um, so jump in at any point as well as the other jurors. Uh, we did start a Zoom poll and um, we're, this is an experiment as well. If you could choose the best category that sums up uh, what your role would be, um, we'll see how that goes. Um, there is a back channel going that we're we're starting, uh, if you follow this URL, and I'm hoping one of the co-moderators can put this in the chat. Um, if you have a question, uh, because we have a thousand, uh, or we have a lot of participants, we would like you to just type your question in the chat and um, our co-moderators will be watching for those and we'll, we'll feed them to Ed um, at the half hour mark. So, one of the things that we'd like for you to do, and one of the traditions of the master class, is to share things. So, if you have, uh, this is a, a completely open Google Doc. So, if you have any news, research announcements, or resources, if you could just put your name and put a link, uh, that'll go out to everybody. Also, on that is uh, our handout packet. Um, one of you may be wondering what dust or magic refers to, and it comes from um, a book by Bob Hughes that um, we think works very well with digital and making digital projects. And that is an idea can turn from dust to magic depending up, upon the amount of talent that rubs against it. And when we review a lot of the different apps and VR projects and things this year, we can tell the people who really understand the interactive medium. So that's what this masterclass is about. There are links in this document that go to um, the formal announcement of the winners. 
the jurors were able to meet right before all the quarantine started. And uh, we were able to make our choice. And um, there is no coincidence that one of the um, winners was a, had to do with a pandemic. I, I have no idea how that worked out. But um, other things in, um, in this are links to the, uh, a PDF of the, hand, the formal handout packet for the master class. And uh, there are also two archived talks from previous master classes at Bologna, Christoph Neiman's How I Made a Children's App. If you haven't seen it, it's absolutely delightful. He's referring to Chomp. And then also John Cromie's App Craft. John Cromie was the programmer for TouchPress. And uh, he was the guy who made the Barefoot World Atlas, which was one of the shortlist this year. So lots of things and resources for you. There's also a link to the latest issue of Children's Technology Review, which is my publication. And in that is a tribute to the Bologna Children's Book Fair. And there's a photo of what we're all missing right now and how we'll never replace that with Zoom. But um, the other thing is we've never had a master class for 326 people. Um, but um, we will do this next year. Um, to give an overview, and then I'm going to turn it over to the jurors, but uh, to give an overview of what we looked at this year, there were uh, 94 submissions from 29 countries. Now these consisted of, of apps, um, all, all forms of different uh, web delivered content. Uh, there's some Oculus product, uh, products. Uh, we chose one winner uh, and three special mentions. And so we'll be discussing those. Um, and there were five jurors from Italy, UK, Spain, and the United States. So without further ado, I will show you the, jur the judging in process. Now that's Lucy in the VR goggles. That's Neil uh, looking stuff up. And it's a wonderful uh, two-day experience where we um, debate and work hands-on to actually test these, these products. And that's something that you don't see with a lot of other jurors. We actually meet face-to-face. -face. And um, there is a video that we made. So at the, at the very end, we point a camera at us and we talk about the trends. And so if you're interested in that, um, this one hour Zoom session uh, won't give you the information you want, but if you are serious about developing on the digital side, there's some very important trends that you should be aware of. And um, so watch the video or better yet, uh, listen to Neil Hoskins who will, uh, we will uh, uh, stop sharing. I'll turn it over to Neil. And you're first up. Um, Neil, what did you see this year as a juror, and um, what, it, what would you like to tell us? Thanks, Warren, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us here today. It's a great, and it's a first edition of this online special Duster Magic. I'm very happy that so many people could join us as in this, what is an experiment. I know a lot of experiments have been going on for, with book fairs, too, so it's, it's a great um, whole new uh, era for us all. I'm going to share a screen now, one of my screens, and I'm going to talk about two applications. So let me just do that. So this is where we should be usually. Um, and this is a screen of where the judges usually give their comments in the wonderful digital cafe uh, at the fair. And for those of you who haven't visited us here, or haven't been um, involved in that, this is where we all gather together and we discuss the winners um, each year for over an hour or so, as we're doing here today. Um, here is Lucy, obviously, and Warren, Roberta too, and Sylvia from a few, few years back, and some of our winners then. But for today, um, what I wanted to talk about is two apps from the 2020 award. And I think, Something that's interesting for me as a, as a judge for the first time, even though I've been involved in developing the digital community for Bologna, is what do we call quality in app work? 
what is what is quality for us because it may be a little different from what quality may be for the for the judges in the other uh, regazzi awards and it's often a personal choice it's often sometimes subjective but for the actual media of the app i think for me there are two parts which i always look at and that is making the media inside the focus and making it not difficult to get to that media uh, and a state of artness sort of feel to the media that you're using you you actually get an awareness and feel the developers care and craft in how they've gone about putting this these applications together um, so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to stop sharing uh, uh stop sharing this screen and then we're going to I'm going to share my iPad screen. So this is all the, um, let me just see here. I have to click in and out of these. While you're transitioning, Neil, just a reminder that this session is being recorded. And so uh, we plan on uh, distributing it to the world afterward for those people who can't join us. So be aware that, um, that it is being recorded. Okay, and now so we see Neil's iPad. Um, we're going to look at two apps now over the, the few minutes I have with you. So the first one I'm going to present and actually Lucy's going to talk um, about Pool Cool. So let's go straight into this application. So um, this is Puku, which was one of the apps on the shortlist. Um, and uh, the great thing about Puku, you can see this is actually bringing a Merriam and Webster dictionary to a children's app. But immediately you can see it looks very different to a children's uh, dictionary. You've got a really engaging creature there that slowly grows as you learn new words. And it designs great pedagogy. So the learning design is really good. Um, so it includes various different ways of accessing the content, some of which help you consolidate knowledge like typing in the actual letters and others are more um, uh, of uh, multiple choice. And the lovely thing about that is it helps you to first of all um, see uh, and build on existing knowledge because some of the multiple choice is uh, is easy um, to guess which the right answer might be because the other ones are irrelevant and then it gets harder so you get more and more relevant options to choose from so the learning design is really good you can see the UX design is very clear it's very simple and easy to use it's visually good you've got playful sounds um, so this is a really great example of bringing what would have been a very traditional dictionary book format to into a much more engaging learning experience uh, for children. Great. Thank you, Lucy. I mean, I think that's uh, the reimagining here, the actual, the care and craft, the reimagining what a dictionary can be for young learners and, and for kids and young people wanting to improve their vocabulary is a delight here. Um, the second act, which I'm going to look at, is super simple. And I think here, in terms of just the entrance here, you have this wonderfully playful and a simple wheel to choose from over, Super Simple is an app with over 600 pieces of different content for kids, including video, eBooks uh, and games. And I think what, what is really appealing in terms of the different um, parts is even when you enter into the library, it's very easy to see where to go. The interface is simple. And even the backgrounds have inside them an interactivity of different characters appearing in these wonderful landscapes. And you, know, you can work easily through the different sections. So here, in, in these, all these different sections and the different icons, you can actually have a whole library of what would be like a whole Netflix channel for kids to enjoy uh, simple and uh, very referenced um, media. And there we go, in and out. So those are just two apps, and I know we have a lot to get through today and not a lot of time, but I think they just give you a flavor of the way in which we have looked at the apps and brought them out to be some of the ones that really kind of caught our eye for that quality issue and, and how we define that. So what I want to do now is to hand back over to Lucy. So I'll stop sharing my screen and then Lucy's gonna continue on 
with a number of apps that, that she saw and within the winning um, selection that we made. So over to you, Lucy. Hi, yes. So um, first of all, just to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, um, I was originally the founder of the Good App Guide in the UK, which is a review website for children's apps um, that's now part of the Good Play Guide. Um, uh, I actually now uh, work as a freelance consultant supporting people who are developing apps for children, uh, bringing in kind of the learning angle, the user-centered angle, creativity and, and all sorts of other things. So, um, so I get involved with lots of different apps and and as, well, as, as Neil was just saying, one of the important things is to think about what makes a really good quality app. And for me, it's a combination of factors. Um, the art and the sound quality has to be brilliant. The content has to be good. The gameplay has to be really good. Um, but also if you're talking about um, children's apps, it has to show a really strong understanding of the audience. So you have to have good user experience. Experience, but you also have to understand the ages and stages of the children you're, um, you're uh, addressing as your audience. And if it's got a learning purpose, you have to really understand the pedagogy of learning. And if you're developing an app, you have to think about all of those things in the development, as well as your marketing and business angles. Um, and anything that gets left out of that mix tends to bring the quality of the app down. Now, the two out of the selection, we as jurors each picked a couple to talk about. The two I was going to focus on um, were Paper Bar an AR maker um, for slightly different reasons. Now, obviously, we were doing this as part of a uh, book fair. So we always look particularly at those that have story aspects within them. And I think one of the things that's really interesting on um, the uh, on that perspective is I think the book industry has always been the publishing industry generally has always been very nervous about um, in going interactive and, and some of the early attempts to do this uh, have not worked terribly well but we're seeing a resurgence of people um, trying things and being very successful and a couple of the ones in the shortlist um, including this one which is Paperbark um, are really playful now this is uh, an Australian um, uh, setting um, that tries to encourage you through a story um, but in an interactive way so you're tapping on things and you're uh, there's some gameplay involved so you're actually trying trying to um, uh, achieve things, not just follow the flow of the story as you go along. You're encouraged to collect things. You're encouraged you have to tap for this little wombat to walk along, um, follow the footprints. And it helps you in cover, in this case, it's a very environmental message. It helps you to learn about that in a, um, a fun and playful way without um, uh, it just replacing a book. It's adding value. And I think that's really interesting. And it, I don't think that streamed terribly well, but it gave you an idea of the quality of the audio and also the visuals and how easy it is to interact with it. Um, another one I wanted to pick up on briefly was AR as a subject. Now, I think last year we changed the format this year and went for sort of one overall winner and a, and a longer, a little short list of about 10. But um, uh, and we'd had an AR prize the previous year. But what's quite interesting is that in um, last year, we had Wonderscope and things like Ghostomatic that were really amazing AR formats. This year, we didn't feel the uh, format had moved on a lot. There are a lot of people working on AR apps, and I think that AR and VR are gonna come more and more to the front. But we saw more of things like AR Maker, and AR Maker is a great example of creating a tool out of an app, something that allows children to be creative. Apps can often be said to be something that children get kind of plugged into and it's a very, um, uh, you know, gets rid of their creativity. And so to see something like AR Maker, which is effectively a tool that allows children to create AR scenes in their living room in AR, um, and learn therefore about this new technology. And I think that's what made that really exciting. There are a whole host of other ones um, that I just mentioned very, very briefly um, are things like um, uh, Marco Polo World School, which has a wonderful database of videos. So that kind of a bit like Super Simple had various things in there that help children learn about um, science. And um, uh, we have have various a whole host of other ones like the barefoot atlas which is absolutely fantastic way of visualizing geography and, and racing around the globe and finding out and, and turning an encyclopedia an, an atlas effectively into something really engaging so it doesn't matter what your subject is i guess the message for me is 
understand how you're going to teach children to learn if it's a learning game make it easy from a ux perspective and then get the package right the art the sound the content and the gameplay and then hopefully you'll be in a really really strong position so I'm going to hand over now to Roberta, who's going to pick up on, I think, another couple of apps. Um, uh, and then we've got various other things to talk about, such as how, you know, COVID is changing the landscape uh, and some of the exciting things um, that are coming out of remote working, etc. So I'll hand over to Roberta. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thanks to everybody. Good afternoon or good morning for those of you who are in a different part of the world. I have six quick um, points I want to share with you about the prize and about in general what's happening to kids' digital content. Uh, first of all, coronavirus virus pandemic is a game changer. Before the pandemic, we were discussing about screen time and a balanced media diet. Uh, but today, with 1.2 billion children out of the classroom, families are trying to develop new approaches to education and looking for quality contents on screen. Just to give you an idea, in, in April, our website, Mama Maman, that reviews digital contents for kids, has had three times the contents, the contacts it had in January. And Disney Plus has doubled its subscribers during the pandemic. Uh, basically, during the lockdown, people were told to stay at home and read a book. But people actually stayed at home and turned their screens on. This is a matter of fact, but we have to convert the present book market crisis in an opportunity, starting from a new relationship between publishing and screens. Uh, what kind of contents are family looking for? Uh, from our experience, movies are among the most searched content, together with learning tools and contents for kids with special needs. These are the big three areas that immediately respond to family needs, entertainment, education, and special needs. A family willing to pay for those digital contents? I would say yes and no. People tend to look for free products as they did before. One of the most popular posts of our website at the moment is a collection of free resources. However, more, I believe more and more parents are willing to pay, especially for learning platforms. Many families have subscribed during the, the pandemic to free access and will probably keep the sub subscription in future. Uh, therefore, we will probably see more content platforms, such as uh, the one that uh, Neil was, was showing with subscription access. What are the strategies developers have put in place to cope with market sustainability? Uh, they have worked in the past years on economies of scale, on a global approach to cover development costs, on serializing. For example, reusing the same code with different graphics and content. And we have seen something like that in the Bologna shortlist this year. For example, mm -hmm. Think Rolls Space by Avokiddo. Uh, it sort of reinterprets the, the, the format of Think Rolls puzzle in a space version, or Pango Musical March, another app in the shortlist, developed the universe of Pango characters with a different gameplay. Both of these are text free apps which require um, a minimum effort in order to localize the product on a global market. And what, since we are um, uh, dealing with a, with a book fair, what about storytelling? We must keep in mind that in a connected world, narratives are fragmented across different media, building worlds in which each narrative works, in which each medium contributes for a piece of storytelling, like in a puzzle. This year's winner, uh, The Wanderer, Frankenstein Creature, reinvents a book, a classic novel, such as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, in the form of a video game with outstanding illustration and an interesting gameplay. But The Wanderer is also a prequel that you can play online, focused on Mary Shelley and the writing of the novel. And I would not be surprised if the video game would become also a picture book, given its beautiful hand-drawn illustrations. Therefore, we have to imagine mixed business models, which consider different media, both online and, and offline. We must work on physical and digital experiences as a unique and interconnected ecosystem. This is something that is already happening in the field of children apps. Uh, FITE, one of the winners of, of uh, Bologna Ragazzi Award in, in the past years, um, 
has become, fam has, has become famous through a series of apps, but is going to become a cartoon series. Sagomini's characters have also become physical toys. So, and myself, I've been working on a project called Meteor Heroes, which features six heroes that fight climate change. It aired on Cartoonito as a cartoon series last week, but it started five years ago as an app. And since the beginning, character design and storytelling have been developed, thinking about future cartoon series, books, licensing, and educational projects with schools. So what does this whole new scenario mean from a publishing point of view? It means we have to keep in mind that innovation is not just about technology. It means finding new ways of designing and distributing content in which physical experiences, included books, play an important role. In a digital world, paper books are not the only means of transferring knowledge to future generations, but they still play a significant role. They have to do with authority and social relevance, even for young people. Just think about YouTubers whose success is not legitimized unless they go mainstream and publish a book. Or I'm thinking about what happens with Wattpad, a social reading platform used mainly by millennials and Generation Z. The stories that have success on Wattpad become paper books, TV series and movies. So I believe it is this perspective of narrative ecosystem that must be taken into consideration by publisher. I thank you and I hand over to Ed and the, for the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. And Ed, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes. All right. So guys, just a side note here, um, it's working. This is working. We haven't blown up the internet. Um, the, the very fact that we're able to do this, I think we should take a pause. And, you know, it took the Bologna Children's Book Fair to be the, the catalyst to pull this together in the first place. Uh, but this is allowing us to have a lot of different, a different kind of interaction. So um, it's pretty cool. Um, Ed, I have the ability to further this experiment to try to blow it up. It hasn't broken yet. So what I could do is I can give people the, the option to unmute themselves. Got it. So everyone will be muted by default. Everyone's been, you don't have a choice, but I can give you the option to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, and I can, we can see where that goes. Now as, as the host, I can also mute everybody up again if, if somebody's dog starts barking absolutely should i should i let it let that happen let me uh let me ask one question of maybe each of the panelists just to get things kind of started Good. but i'm gonna start um um i want to start actually with something roberta said which i think is is very relevant um you referenced the fact that uh disney plus for example you know doubled its subscribers in covid and since we're really in this moment Let's just start by focusing on that because it goes to your question, your point about mixed business models and the interaction between physical and digital realm. But I'm just curious from your point of view, because so many of us uh, are streaming and Netflix is now the, the richest media company in the world. Do you foresee more interactivity that way? Because a lot of parents are using that interface with the streaming media as their primary source of both entertainment and education right now, rather than even the phone or the iPad. So you're, you're mentioning that you are meaning streaming on uh, interactivity on Netflix or even generally speaking? Both. Yeah, both. They have, they have actually tried, they have actually tried uh, an interactive uh, TV series on, on Netflix. But I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we are we are there yet. So interactivity right. through uh, interactivity through t uh, there have been a series of uh, video games, especially developed in the UK, uh, to teach, for example, uh, first aid uh, techniques to uh, to kids or to a general public. 
and those were interactive videos uh, which were interesting but my uh, my idea is that we are not there yet with a substantial meaningful experience so we have a lot of new technologies like lucy was mentioning ar and vr yes i, I believe we are not there they they might have they might develop new interesting experiences in the future but at the moment uh, we are still seeing a lot of uh, experimenting with experiments in the field. Right, but no examples yet that have really taken that vision and- Breakthrough. Yeah, yeah breakthrough, great word. Um, this is for, for Lucy and for Neil alternately, but let's start with Lucy since you were the, the second last person to speak there. You talk, um, because your expertise is in education and you talk about, again, this moment, uh, the importance of getting the pedagogy Correct. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that word may intimidate a lot of the people in our audience because it implies uh, a certain um, profundity that, uh, you know, that sometimes creatives may not, uh, you know, be at the forefront because Neil highlighted a different word, which was delight. And I think how do those, and this is a question for both of you, how do those, both of those words interplay both in the, I think you showed us several examples in the apps but how do they interplay, um, how much of that is necessary for, for the developers and the, and the creatives who are watching this? How, how, um, how important is that as, a, as an ingredient into the work that they're gonna be uh, thinking about or developing? Okay, so, so it's a really, really interesting question. And I've got kind of many, I could talk about this for hours, so I'll have to be brief. Um, but one of the fairly interesting things I find is when I talk, work with, that's actually most interesting, is when I work with groups who go, we need to try really hard not to make it too educational. So there seems to be a fear that educational mill means boring. Um, and I think that um, often comes because very uh, historically educational stuff is quite dull. Um, and as a result, it gives, almost gives teams an excuse to move away from good pedagogy. I agree the word pedagogy is slightly terrifying for a lot of people. And I think it's, it is to some extent completely unnecessary. And um, what you're really talking about it, it, in the sense of using that word, it's almost a kind of a show off word. I think what is more important is just to say, if you want to teach people with your app, mm. you need to understand the, both the process of teaching to some yes. degree, that may be done quite quickly by just interviewing some teachers and talking to them about how it works. Um, and that's something that people do or bringing in someone like me, who's kind of an educational consultant to, to help okay. with that. Or, um, and, and I should say, you also need to understand um, the content itself you're teaching, but also the age group. And I think one of the big things, and you, you can learn this so simply by reading the odd book or, you know, literally it could be something that only takes you a couple of hours to get the basics of what is it um, that you're trying to get across. Then it brings in the other part of your question, what you really want to do right to get an, a, an interactive app to work well, just as an inspired teacher would in the classroom, is to engage your audience. If you look at the science of learning, then the three kind of elements, if you talk to a lot of people, are engage, build on existing knowledge and consolidate that knowledge. So the very first point is if you do not grab the attention of the people and engage the people you're talking to, they're not going to take in, they're not going to bother. And that's right. the same if you're standing in a classroom or you're using an app, but in an app, you don't have a human who can bring in the excitement. Generally, you can't rely on a parent sitting there. So you have to make sure the app itself does that. So I think really in the end, if you're trying to make any kind of content, regardless of whether you know anything about learning and teaching and the details, the important thing is to be really engaging. And I think that it goes over and above everything else. Um, and so get that right, make it easy to use, make it fun and playful yeah. and people can engage with your content. It's the first step is really just exactly. getting them to stay and then you can teach them something. <laughs> exactly. If you don't get that right, they're no longer listening. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, and, and for Neil, again, you referenced uh, the word delight. And I'm curious, is delight enough I mean, is that because we've, we've talked about all the layers and all the needs and ultimately if we're talking about both pedagogy and a business model, 
the light is a great place to start. Is that enough? I mean, can we be satisfied with that as a developer to say, this is just simply delightful as an experience? What do you think? Well, I think there's, there's been a lot of discussion from the word, from the, almost the beginning when apps started to come out about educational apps, what makes an educational app? Are app developers educational companies or are they learning companies? Or is, are they gaming companies? I mean, where do they fit in, um, in all of the people that deliver educational content to kids? No, I, I don't think uh, delight or play is always enough depending on what you're trying to achieve and what age group. I think it comes down again to quality about how many barriers are you putting up to the user to get to, to what is essentially your content that you want them to learn or play with. Yep. And also I think, as I spoke briefly in the beginning, you know, can you feel, you know, it's a very hard question to answer what is quality in an app? It's very, very hard. But if you can feel a sense of quality, if you can think that actually, I think someone's really thought about this for that user. They've actually gone through the development, they thought about well, how they want to deliver it, through what means in terms of a touch interface they want to do that, how simple it is to get to that final moment of learning. Then I think that's the, the balance of achievement that you may be able to assess you know, in, in a prize like this or even as an app developer. You know, what, are we giving that sense to, to, to our audience that it, it is fun, yes, but it, it is also something that I can get to easily, that I can play with, that I can enjoy the colors, the movement, the sounds. The real essence of multimedia is multi, where there are different sensory aspects. And I think, you know, as um, you know, Roberta was talking about during this pandemic, I think it's great that the app has finally had the moment to shine in an educational context because people can actually see it working. It's quite a hard medium for people to understand in reference to the web, what the differences are, but the containment feature of an app, the way it focuses uh, a child or user's attention into that one place. I think now a lot of parents have actually seen, and you know what, I may have been, you know, just saying, why are you using all these different things? But now actually I've seen you use these things. I've seen how you actually can learn and actually for an example, a lot of parents probably drop their kids off to school in the morning previous to this and pick them up in the evening and ask them how was school. But now they can actually see what are you learning every day? What is it that you're, and they might just see some of these wonderful apps that have been worked on for many years. I mean, a lot of people who have joined us here today, for ex example, have been working on apps for four, five, six years. And this process is actually an iterative yeah. one. The it's a and the development. Uh, it's a contained, safe experience too. One that a parent can have confidence. Unlike maybe even dropping their child at school, they know what they're going to get within an app environment. Provided, you know, they've done a little bit of taken time to to assess what the child is working with. I, I think one of the things that may come out of this is that parents might get actual sense to start discussing with teachers start mm. discussing with schools and everyone together, understand what is, what are we doing in education and how can we help and understand all of this circle of learning that goes on. So it may mean developers also talking to, to kids and parents, parents talking to schools. And yeah, you know, I think um, seeing um, in my family here, a, a primary school teacher trying to teach young kids every day and how that has had to evolve over the last month is quite incredible. How much it's been asked mm -hmm. of a teacher on what the different view of a lesson or, a, or, or online teaching is. And I think for, to your question, you know, delightful and, and pedagogically sound apps help, but mm -hmm. also how are they integrated into mm -hmm. that teacher or that professional's life to actually use them alongside yeah. talking and educating their kids even online. So there's, there's so much to be discussed here. And, I, and like Lucy, I think we could have a whole session on what you know, COVID-19 has meant for kids' content in terms of an educational learning context. Okay, Warren, I see questions coming in. Should we, um, should we address some of those and let some, let some folks ask some questions? Yeah, let's, let's give this a go. Um, there are some wonderful developers that, who submitted products that I'm seeing, and I wish we could all share a glass of some good wine and 
Bentivoglio together, but next year. Um, okay, here we go, Ed. I'm going to allow participants to unmute themselves through the magic of Zoom. So you can now unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And that includes you guys, you publishers who've worked so hard. Francois, I see you. Uh, Jaffet, I see you. That's just a couple. This is so exciting. Uh, Axel, I see you. Um, this is your time. Hi. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, who is this? Sorry, um, name, go ahead. My name is Shana and I'm from London. Hello. What do you do, Shana? <laughs> I, I write and illustrate children's books. Very good. Um, and I just wanted to ask, I thought Roberta's um, suggestion about uh, the interaction between digital and physical, brilliant. Um, and um, my daughter had a wonderful book by Tony Ditalizzi, The Search for Wonder, which had um, keys every so often that you'd hold up to the, um, the webcam and then it would unlock a map. Um, it didn't do so much, but I thought it was a brilliant way to interact with like reading and inspiring the child to kind of carry on and then, it, you know, it could have unlocked new mysteries that you could, you know, only see through the, the next stage with the computer and then go back to the book. And I thought it's a brilliant idea, but um, how would you um, advise um, people like me who are skilled in the writing and illustrating but not in the app um, area to be able to unlock and, um, and um, investigate that side of things? Um, well, I start, can I, should I answer? I would start from the, from, from the, from the end. Um, you should find uh, a person that is able to, that, that is able, is proficient in technology and can help you to develop. Uh, the, the whole production process of an app starts from designing content and interactions and is a quite comp and then uh, developing the code. And you really need a good staff with uh, different professional skills to develop a good, uh, a good app. So that, that's a, a big an important point to make. And for what concerns uh, interaction between the physical and the digital, I think we have to, uh, I think we have to think about what's a relevant experience. Because for example, I'm not sure, um, all the AR experiences that connect a book with the digital with digital content are actually working. Just because of the ergonomy of a book, if you have to hold your device and then you have to hold the book and you are, you are a kid, you need a parent to hold it. So it's it's something quite complex, and I don't think it it's we are there. I don't think it's a breakthrough experience. As, uh, as Ed was, was saying. So I think we still have to work. AR, it's a wonderful technology, for example, but we have to work on different ways to use it. And I think Pokemon showed us what you can do with AR, actually. Roberta, there's something else I wanted to add, but I forgot what it was. Um, I can't <laughs> remember what it was. Let me think. Um, so so I, I wanted to... Um, I just bring up the uh, VR and the Oculus. Uh, this is the Oculus Quest and uh, it's below $500 all in one. And we saw some really exciting work. And my advice uh, would be to th keep your eyes open right now. We still are at the very, even though we're, you know, Elena might disagree that, that you know, we've been exploring for so many years, but we really are at the beginning of this medium and so the way you understand it is by looking at a lot of projects i would suggest looking at the winners in the short list and make sure you we have videos of all of them so you can get your head around kind of where they are so know who's doing the good work and then also watch the tools uh, a lot of work in, is being done in unity right now unity can port very well to either android ios or uh, oculus 
and start using the affordances of each medium to ask yourself the age old question, how do I tell a story? How do I get quality to a young, a young mind, a young curious child and get the technology out of the way so that those ideas can come through. So it, it is a very exciting, uh, space. And I think I, I speak for the rest of the jurors when I say that we still are finding really wonderful work in people who are explorers who are actually making this work uh, for children. So um, keep your eyes open. It, it's a cool space to be in. Can I think I, um, illustrator I... as well, it's uh, quite good to um, look at the layers and the way that people <clears throat> work in layers, looking at animation as well, and what animation can be, how that can be used in your work. And I would I, uh, just send you a message in the in the chat, but look at the work of, for example, Christoph Nyman and what he's done in terms of his work with magazine covers, which has included moving images and AR, because he's looked at he's looked at uh, working with developers in a very from the viewpoint of an illustrator, from a creative viewpoint. And I think a lot of his work is 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 first class, but also it adds a creative aspect to it. And in terms of I think AR, yes, I think it's. Roberta's right, it is still not quite there. I think uh, we have a developer here um, um, from Denmark, Axel, who, who actually worked on some books where the, the AR point, point was, you would point at the book and then you would take some of the artwork out of the book and then into another story. And I think that that was often using a, really a lot of illustrators work to do that and extra extra content that was triggered by something with AR and then taken into the device, which and then you no longer needed the book. So I think that's an interesting and yet to be fulfilled part of AR. Sorry, Lucy. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. Um, I totally agree with Roberta, well, with what everyone said, but um, in terms of finding the right people to help, um, if you are thinking about moving from, from kind of book skills. But I would also say uh, one of the things you want to do is involve children um, in the process as early as possible. So um, think about, um, for example, in the, the experience you just talked about and, and an example Roberta gave, um, you can quickly find that adding to a book during the reading experience um, doesn't work but there are many ways I've seen that it can work and you can often sketch that out and, and, and kind of pretend um, uh, and get the children involved in a kind of collaborative design exercise and kids can really help you work out what will help what they will enjoy if you're clever about it and almost design it like an activity that's often how I do it I almost design it as if it's today we're going to pretend we're making a, an app and the kids actually get into it they think they're making it themselves but they give you some really good ideas of of what's effective in a way that we're quite narrow in our thinking of what a book is particularly if you're trying to move out of that format so involving the kids can be really great um I, there have been some comments about the cost um and yes it can be very expensive to get into uh, apps and never underestimated if you're used to writing a book and you think you can just create an app as a sort of parallel thing that's much the same it's a very different skill um, and there's lots of cost involved that's not to say you shouldn't try um, but it, you need to go in with your eyes open and understand that there's a lot of marketing involved and, and other aspects that works very differently to a book on its own um, and finally on the AR comment that, that various people have made in this um, in response here the um, AR is absolutely coming um, actually in the projects that I've worked on in the last few months almost all of them have had an AR aspect and the stuff that's coming through is really really exciting we haven't seen that yet in the in the kind of things that have been submitted apart from in fact we did last year I think I think what we saw from Ghostomatic, um, and I think I've seen Jaffa in the list of people today, um, and from Wonderscope, who was uh, from Preloaded last year, they were really impressive and exciting and where AR is going in this space. Um, and we're kind of now in the gap before those front runners turn into more of a mainstream response. So if you want good examples of what AR can do, I would point you back to those two um, to have a good look at. I would also throw in just something, as far as resources go, um, Warren has alluded that this has been ongoing for several years. So if this is your first time coming to um, to Duster Magic, go back into look at the previous year's winners because many of them are no less relevant now than they were when they won several years ago. You have some great examples of uh, of of how apps have developed. So I would encourage everybody to do that as well. Um, 
would we like to take another pic or another uh, another direct question from somebody out there in the uh, in the uh, in the World Wide Web? Here we go. Good afternoon to everyone. You hear me? Yes. Please introduce okay. yourself. Hi, I'm Eleonora from Luca, Tuscany. Um, uh, we were talking uh, previously about the um, the increase in uh, in during the pandemic about the access about on, on learning online learning resources, and um, my question is about parents. Um, do you think that parents are using apps and other online resources? just to keep their children quiet and busy while they're doing something else? Or do you think they are really engaging in the learning process? And uh, do you think we need to educate parents about engaging in learning, in the kids' learning activities? Yeah, I'd, do you want me to pick this one up? So um, in, in terms of um, uh, the parents, uh, there is always a case that parents use anything they can get their hands on to keep children quiet, particularly younger kids, but it can go all the way through. Absolutely, parents are doing that sometimes. But I do think that what this COVID-19 crisis has done is made parents try to do that from an educational perspective a lot more than they have in the past because they suddenly have a we always feel guilt as i'm a parent <laughs> and we always have a tendency to feel very guilty about our children's use of screens it's very easy to feel like they're overdoing it um, but a lot of the time that's a background guilt you think school deals with work and learning and you can kind of not worry too much about that what covid's done is sent a whole load of parents out going i have to cover this stuff that school isn't doing, and I must find content that does that. I've been writing reviews of this stuff for years, and many of my best friends at the beginning of this, who I thought I'd given great advice to on apps over the years, suddenly went, Lucy, can you tell me again all those great apps that, and suddenly that, you know, the numbers of, of people on referral schemes have suddenly gone, gone through the roof. People are really concentrating. I think what's then interesting is what happens once they've got that content what parents mostly want once their kids are on it are not to be terribly involved they kind of want to be able to see what their kids are doing when they want to see and they want an amount of control so they can say you know i set this piece of work because the teacher told me i should perhaps but the rest of the time they want the app to just do the job for them they don't want to have to sit next to them because they don't have time we're used as parents to having these hours when they should be in school to ourselves whether we're working or whatever we're doing and i think um that they expect the app almost to do a bit more than it's geared up to do um and actually i think in many ways um it, it's it, that's where it evolves and the, the apps that have been massively successful I think during this crisis are the ones that do hold a child's attention whilst appearing from the parent's perspective to tick the box of my child did something educational and valuable and there are some great great and I've, I've written a whole bunch of things if you look on my website of um, suggestions of various apps that have, I find uh, from experience of testing with lots of families that work really well um, uh, but I think that's that's the bar it's got to it's got to engage long enough it's got to be doing something specific and the parent has to feel like the child's learning and the child has to enjoy it I, I do, do think, think that um, go ahead I Neil. Think that also I think in today's world where we're living the conversation between parents teachers um, and sharing of this, because it's not, it's not only about what apps are good, but how to work with apps, how to get online, how to communicate. And I think perhaps that's part of the community share is to understand each other a bit more, for schools to get some knowledge about what kind of devices uh, parents have, how they are connected, what they understand that, and actually take some notes about what's happened in this crisis because this is not always going to be like this. Our life won't always be like this, but some of it may change quite, quite dramatically. So start to understand together where we've been successful, where we haven't, and understand each other. Because I think schools, kids, parents, they're all quite separate siloed sort of parts of our society. And they communicate very rarely, except for like parents meeting. But if actually we understand more about 
the difficulties of parents to get online, the difficulties of parents to, to download apps, what they should download or what they shouldn't. I think there's a whole discussion there that we kind of just used to not have because it was the teacher taught, I was the parent, the kid went to school. But now all of that, I hope, may change. I've Sorry. been I just, oh, Sorry. Oh. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Aruda. Uh, no, I just wanted to add something uh, related to the last question. Uh, I believe uh, the average media literacy of parents, uh, well, the, the European experience, I don't know about it, the US, but it's quite low. And this has to, to do, uh, to deal with the fact that we are a generation that has of non, of, of parents that are not native digital. They are, not, they are, they have experienced new media when they were grown up. So, um, this is one of the problems and it's probably, uh, there's a, a big issue of working, uh, especially in schools uh, with digital and in gen generally speaking, media education. So that, that's an issue that we have uh, to deal with in the future, I believe. I think that um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs has shifted because of the COVID situation. And what I mean by that is that it's, made people who don't have internet and devices that can run apps and quality media, uh, they're, they, they're painfully aware of the fact that they, they cannot get videos, they can't get movies, they can't get any information, they can't get news. The libraries are shut down in the United States and th there's a whole generation of families and children who are in the dark right now. And so I think screen time has a new meaning that's not a bad connotation. Screen time is now seen as a basic need along with shelter, good nutrition and quality media. So I, my hope that out of this is that the work that many people are doing, the very hard work, and we know that it's very hard work to make quality interactive media for children uh, is appreciated and paid for and valued uh, as we come out of this situation? Well, certainly one of the things people can um, potentially look at developing is something to educate people about COVID because we're seeing a lot of need, particularly in emerging and developing markets for things that uh, will educate people in that regard. Um, I do have a quick question. Lucy, you alluded to apps that have really taken off during this, uh, during this crisis. Are there maybe two, two or three examples of apps? Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking necessarily for worthy apps, but I'm curious as to an app or two that has really proven popular right now and, and why that might be. Okay, um, uh, one of the ones is actually not an app, but um, a digital content for kids that's taken off hugely that I think is particularly relevant here is Night Zookeeper. I don't know how many people are familiar with Night Zookeeper. Um, so Night Zookeeper is a, uh, an, a creative writing tool, essentially. It's been around a while and mainly pushed to schools, um, but is also has a just a parent can sign up for homeschooling anyway and their homeschooling part has absolutely gone crazy so um, what they've done which is really interesting is um, you can draw a digital creature um, for your own night zoo so you're a night zookeeper and you create these animals and then you write about them and each time you start writing it encourages you to use an adjective or and it knows how old you are so it'll do things that are related to the, your curriculum to make sure that you use, you know, write at least 200 words or, and as you do it, it ticks them off. Um, yeah. And then they actually have a whole resource of people behind the scenes marking the work effectively. So they don't mark it in an excessive way, but they say, oh, wow, I really want to hear the next story. Or, you know, I love the way you've brought this in or this character's really, and they're really one liners but um, it's really, um, it creates this ecosystem. They've also added a gaming element. So there are lots of little mini games in there um, and uh, various things where you can go in and play actual games. And there are ranking systems. So you can get up to, you know, within the top 100 in your, um, in your, in the world or there, and it's got a bit of everything. It's really high quality. Yeah. It's amazing for books. Um, uh, I'm not connected to them in any way. So it's, it is purely, I have also seen over the school holiday, I actually got my own kids then age nine and seven. Um, I 
had seen how good this was in my work, um, but had never used it. And, so, um, Lucy, if you could put the name of that in that resource. I, I will do, yeah. And, er, and everybody else is putting apps in the chat I'm seeing. And so um, let's put the hive mind to, to work here. Um, I like my very hungry caterpillar still. And um, I'm hoping I can, I can introduce you to my grandson who's re-educated me on the power of quality interactive media. The list is a long one. Yes. No, it's good. It's um, yeah, it's good because there's obviously if if it's um, one of the things about this time too is as an app becomes more popular, it's going to get more feedback. One presumably will see it become more and re more refined, and then the app, the whole ecosphere, the whole ecosystem is going to become better and better and better. Which is something that because of the suspicion that there has been, um, you know, it, it ebbs and wanes over the last decade uh, since we've been following this, but you know, the perception of the utility of apps ebbs and wanes over the years. The more people who are using them, the more feedback, the better everybody's gonna be. So when we have this conversation next year, we can assume there's gonna be even those levels of sophistication will have ratcheted up significantly. Not to say it was lacking before, but I think we can anticipate um, you know, an even stronger uh, group of applicants for the prizes next year, for example. Yeah. Was there, um, we have about 10 minutes because we don't want to stretch our, uh, everybody's patience or, or screen time for the day. But uh, another question or two would be welcome. Um, anyone out there want to raise a hand and, and Warren can uh, address them? You can also unmute yourself. Hello, Jason. So Canada is in the Hi. house. Hello, thank, hello. You. thank you for Forest Flyer, Jason. Um, my grandson loves that little bird. Join Robin. Yeah, Robin. Yeah. Great, great app. So, Jason, do you have a question or do you want to uh, introduce yourself and, and ask something? <laughs> I have no question. I am, I am merely lurking until Warren called me out. Ah. <laughs> can't, can't lurk. Can't lurk. I just want to say, I mean, if we're, if we're kind of rounding up with some comments um, yeah. to round up the session, I think there was, a, there was a quote recently I heard it was used actually during the Obama years, a crisis is a terrible situation to waste. And I really feel that in talking with developers, as I do as part of the digital um, Bologna community and outside that, it, it is a great moment for the app to really shine and and become generally accepted as a format. And, and I hope that, you know, in terms of relating back to publishers, as Roberta put quite eloquently and in, in detail about how apps fit in in an ecosystem of publishing of books um, and um, yeah, TV shows and, uh, and other medias, we have a real connected publishing space opening up. And I hope that publishers will, again, return to see what can I do in an app world? What, how can I make my wonderful stories successful? Because I think you, Ed, mentioned that, you know, what are the most successful stories on Netflix? They are usually ones that come from books. Books are the wonderful, you know, they, they generate these extremely uh, amazing, wonderful stories that come from great imaginations. And, and they trigger a lot of what everyone does here. You know, from, from apps like, you know, Hungry Caterpillar that comes from the Eric Carl book, but even from like some of the latest apps like, you know, Jason's um, uh, Sego Mini School, where all of these things that are in there come from storytelling and the way in which narrative happens, characters tell the stories and all the different parts of what makes an engaging piece of media. So, I mean, I'd just like to fly a flag that for all these people who've been working so damn hard for the last decade, con let's congratulate them. And I hope to see, yes, even taking a ratchet up, but actually delivering out into the world now that is ready to accept the work that, that has been done for so many years. I, I just um, would like to um, ask something. Um, do, do people, because Lucy, you were talking a lot about apps you advise other people to uh, towards to um, use. Um, my children are now 12 and 16, and um, I am very strict about um, what they, tend to use um, but when they go to 
um, use like go play games or um, use their um, their phones to seek things. It's usually just for kind of like light-hearted fun and kind of quite mindless um, things. And um, there's a lot of great apps that I'm hearing about for young the younger children's audience. Are there is there an area for development for my age group of like um, teenagers or you know and and are there um, is there advice that you would have of um, apps that are good out there for that age group that takes them away from the Kardashians and into something that's um, great to um, enjoy and instructive or useful? Um, I'm happy to, to start on that one if you like quickly. Um, uh, it, it's a funny world, the app world, in terms of that age group. Uh, interestingly, a lot of things are made for 13 plus um, uh, or even 16 plus, depending on what the GDPR and COPPA rules are in your country. Um, that's often why that they've been made for adults. And also, if you look at the app stores, they don't have a category for kids that is uh, 12 plus. It stops at kind of 11. Um, so they really think of child as being. Um, uh, primary age so actually when you work in the children's industry you often find you are working on those younger ones however as well as the work i do i actually go into lots of um uh, businesses and talk at lunch times to parents about using apps and give advice on managing screen time and on handling social media when you get to teen um, and so I, 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 I've now gone completely blank and can't think of any specific examples, but there are some out there. I think the thing that's interesting when you start to get uh, slightly older is that you move, children move either towards social or maybe both towards social stuff. And it's all about social and their spare time is about social stuff or hardcore gaming. And a lot of it becomes uh, very much games console focused. So you start looking at, and we've been starting to have a conversation about what games console titles or ones that are potentially can be played on a laptop, but are much more considered to be games, not apps, if you see what I mean. Um, there are, of course, many things, you know, you go back to the Monument Valley days, you have a look at what's being featured in the game section on um, the app store. There are many, many great apps that engage anyone from a child upwards to adults um, that are good and don't have adverts in if you're willing to pay you know a small amount of money so there are lots out there what's also worth looking at is good things that are properly designed to support their education whether that's study tools or proper school-based learning and making that more fun so there are loads of options out there for that age it is a slightly under-resourced area as a focus um, specifically. Interestingly, I am working on one right at the moment that's AR related and for the sort of 10 to 12s age group. So people are doing it, um, but the older you get, the more it tends to be, less it tends to be, less there tends to be focused on that age range. And suddenly it becomes, this is for everyone, this is an adult app. Um, so yeah, but I would, I would recommend having a little browse around the uh, Apple, the game section in Apple and look but what's there on your device if you've got an apple device or the same on the google play store but if you look in as as you know the, the ones the editors picks um there are often some really good adventure games or different types of things in there that that are great a previous winner is uh, right below me in my square uh, francois from ulu lab um, i would highly recommend uh slice fractions ethical um phenomenal uh and for that age range francois are are you having a good year things good yeah, yeah, things are good. We're mostly working on the next, uh, the next app, which is going to be like a bigger in scope, and so we're quite busy just doing that. Um, it's been a little bit of a transition, but more, you know, our industry is uh, uh, can adapt quickly to work remotely, right? So, so we're doing good compared to most people here. Our great that. hope is that people like Francois and and Emmett and uh, Jason and Jaffet, people that that's just this screen. Can, uh, I'm missing everybody. Um, you know, people will pay for your products and these are the ethical good things that you pay for and there's there's not a lot of gimmicks or psychological traps. Just, um, just out of curiosity and um, we have uh, again time to just wrap things up a little bit with people, but I guess the one question that uh, will probably go unasked by anybody publicly is, is there actually money for development? Or should we anticipate seeing more resources come into this area? Because I think a lot of folks, again, are intimidated by the potential expense of this. A lot of people experimented early on in the advent of the app, um, you know, and the iPad, 
uh, found it to be very expensive, got very little return on their investments and abandoned the projects. And they have a very difficult time convincing um, either investors or if they work for a company that this is a uh, responsible use of money. So can we expect to see any of that change? And do you have any advice on how to actually get this stuff going? So other than having a great idea, finding the right developer, uh, paying for it, and whether or not you can make money, all of that's irrelevant unless you can get it made. Can people get these paid for? And should we expect to see that change in this new environment? And then maybe everybody can leave with a final closing inspirational thought if we want to go that direction at the end. I think from a publisher's point of view and for, as an investment in a, a medium to long-term investment for a business, if, if you look at, you know, I think one of the apps that we, that we picked out um, the year before was an app by, by our press called Biam. And I think what they've done within their company and what I, I know Stephanie and I think Damien are here too, and they could probably speak in more detail than me, but for now, I'll just speak for them. I think the, the actual braveness where they put the app and the actual development of a digital platform at the center part of their company, you have to have a long-term view on this and you have to actually keep going and keep investing and keep following where and how the market develops. I think the advent of subscriptions has helped publishers provide that we, what we called a few years back library forms of content. I think subscription is the model that allows people to make enough revenue to, to put that as a business proposition within companies. And I think we weren't there as in many parts of the technology, we weren't there in a business format five or six years ago, but I think we are now. There is a lot more in that. And I think that could be a whole, you know, dust and magic or another form, forums session about the business of making apps. Um, but I've seen quite a lot of success stories there with, with longevity and investment and actually pushing it through as a center part, driving uh, the publishing company. So that would be my five pennies worth. Um, I, I was going to say in terms of, um, from my perspective, um, obviously we are all kind of set to um, expect a downturn, you know, there's, there's likely to be all sorts of financial complications in the business world uh, and I'm sure we won't be completely saved from that. But just speaking from my own personal experience, when this uh, kicked off um, uh, a couple of months ago, um, as a consultant, my work kind of dried up. But actually what I found very interesting is very quickly within the last month or so, I've suddenly found people coming back out of the work very quickly. I have been working with a number of teams who are getting investment and grants. People are seeing this as a place to put their money. Um, there are venture capitalists, there are all sorts of innovation funds that are willing suddenly to invest in this area um, and I've had people who were working on like museum experiences going oh we better do something let's let's move into an app experience and I think suddenly people are starting to be open their eyes to the world of digital for kids particularly so I see that as really exciting so I really do think think there could be um, uh, money for this area to develop in future and I really think that having worked with some incredible people um, during this crisis on a number of projects who have shown and um, how possible it is to work remotely I think the other thing that it's opened my eyes to is how feasible it is to do it across the world without us all needing to be sat in the same room uh, and I think that opens up the possibilities for teams to develop these apps, bringing in the right resource from the right place. Um, and I think that is really exciting. I think the idea of remote working taking off even more um, in our future could be, uh, could be a real, really positive thing for this industry. Well, uh, Ed, one, oh, sorry, Laura. Well, the, the one thing I can guarantee to you, you all is that we'll continue okay. exploring um, and we'll tell you the truth. Uh, what's dust and what's magic. We'll try our best and um, we'll make the Bologna Children's Book Fair the place to come to find out what's really going on so that you can avoid those very expensive mistakes and perhaps make some, some magic. Um, so I, I think I'm sort of wrapping this up. I'm feeling that um, people are zoomed out maybe a, a bit. Uh, Ed, do you, you think... Um, we can take one sure. more question. 
can... Well, let's let's get Roberta. You were going to say something, and uh, uh, yeah, just a quick thing. I think it's it's interesting what uh, Apple has done with the video games with Apple Arcade, uh, just to help independent um, developers. So if we had an Apple Arcade uh, for children apps, that would might be uh, another way to uh, make children app uh, by independent uh, the publishers more easily found. It depends uh, what's the share that uh, Apple takes. <laughs> exactly. Well, one of the, one of the things I was going to I was going to mention too, and maybe you can attest to this, is we're conducting this conversation in English, but digital and code is its own language. And so, one of the things that this offer to this offers is an opportunity is you can work with people anywhere in the world. Um, it will it may be a little bit more challenging than going you know working with somebody locally. But that really gives you an opportunity to experiment with styles, experiment with points of view, experiment with different cultures, all of which um, are increasingly relevant to children who are isolated, who aren't going to have a lot of that exposure. So just mm -hmm. something for everybody to keep in mind who's out there who may not be working every day in English. That doesn't necessarily limit your opportunity. Would That's you agree? Right. There we go. Cool. Cool. Well, sure. Um, just to wrap things up, if uh, maybe we can just ask our three panelists and Warren, of course, if you, uh, and I'm going to preface this by saying, if you have maybe one piece, one takeaway that people might be thinking about a best practice to keep in mind uh, to apply to their own work. Um, and again, mine was just what I just said, is to think globally, um, because with digital, it's its own world, its own language, and it does op open opportunities and doors that uh, you might have previously thought were closed, and um, maybe each of you could could add a little bit to that, or or your own uh, your own take on on this current moment in time that we can uh, give some give some thought to as we uh, as we all say goodbye until next year. How about Neil over in Poland? It may, it may not be next year. It may be uh, you know maybe soon. Yeah, uh, given the way this is going, I think I. I think one of the interesting questions for me, and we came up about, uh, you know, educational, how to work with schools and education. It's very hard for app developers to enter what we call the schools or education market. And if a developer does have perhaps a subscription based application, I'd say one of my takeaways would be give that app to schools and give it to some teachers to use. It may be within that ecosystem that that the teacher can actually get to know your work and then actually recommend it back through the school to the children and then out and to the parents. I think that's a good way to start sharing good practice and good apps with schools. Um, let them have access it, to it, let them use it and work with it in the classroom where that's possible. Um, I know there are many things within the app world that sometimes find barriers to, um, to enter the school markets, but I think uh, working with the teacher uh, and actually getting to know teachers in that way by showing them what you've worked on is a great way then to filter through to parents and kids. Um, I guess mine would be building on um, Ed's comment about the uh, about the, the kind of getting, being able to access people across the world. Um, mine would be if you're looking to develop an app make sure you have the right team. Um, think about the team involved with creating it. Don't assume you have all the knowledge yourself. Pull in the right people. Um, and that includes the common things whenever you're doing a digital development, which is obviously your, your graphic design, your, you know, your arts team and your, and your coders, your technical people. But make sure that includes people who really understand the, your audience, not any audience, but your, the audience you really need to um, be involved in keeping that front and center, make sure they want to do user testing and, and involve schools as, as Neil mentioned. Um, and if you are a learning product and you may not be, it may be just purely fun, make sure you bring in that learning side. Um, so I'd say get the audience focus right, get the, the graphic design right, get your content right and get your technical right. So it's really very easy, just, you know, tickle those <laughs> and you'll be all sorted. <laughs> Excellent. And Roberta? Uh, just, uh, just add three, uh, three words, uh, interaction, engagement, and uh, gamification. Those are the three keys. Okay, Warren, uh, back to you. 
All yours. What I would say, Ed, first of all, thanks for doing a great job doing and narrating and uh, coordinating this. And um, I would bring it back to Fred Rogers and remember that whether you make something for print or for screen or for VR, that the child is a very special audience. And we see a lot of products that forget that when business interests, which we've talked a lot about, overlap with child development, there's a Venn diagram there, it can be an ugly place. And children are a special, as Fred Rogers said, a sacred audience. And we have to remember that every child who's out there is innocent and is, that's a, that space between the screen and their mind is a sacred space. And everything that, it, that gets in that space um, needs to be handled very carefully. So definitely make money, but remember children are a special audience. And I say that because um, I save the best for last. Um, my inspiration has just come in. Ed, can't think of a better way to end. Come on, buddy. This is my education. He's, he's going for the iPad. Um, so um, I'd like to, I'd uh -huh. like to <laughs> it, he's been teaching me a lot about uh, Forest Flyer and My Very Hungry Caterpillar and a lot of the stuff you guys make. And so, Lyndon, you want to say thank you to the people who, who made uh, the, your apps? Um, he loves it, by the way. Um, but um, I'd like to give the last word here. I'm going to pull up the, the last slide because as the dates for next year when we can all meet uh, together to Elena. I, I see you're, you're still here. So let me, let me give it back oh, well, to you. Before you do that, could we just say, um, uh, I, I put a glass in the background um, as an imperativo, a, a Campari spritzer there, but I'm sure <laughs> I'd like to say a big thank you to you, Warren. Um, for putting this together as a big experiment, but also in all your years of work with the fair. So, so thank you again for spearheading this and putting together this uh, wonderful online experience uh, for us all. So thanks, Warren. Thank you, thank Neil. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, we do look forward to welcoming you to Bologna again next year, hopefully, I think, yes, with the spritz. And uh, I see that some of you uh, sent question, where's the dinner tonight, Warren? Axel, I, I, I saw you. We'll have the, our dinner next year and uh, we will uh, have a party to, to, um, to, to toast, to make a toast to the Dust of Magic and uh, to all the the digital people around Bologna. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Grazie, thank you. Uh, next year, 12 to 15 April, save the date. We'll see you then. Ciao. 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 Uh, thanks, Lauren. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. I'm waiting for enough people to leave so I can make a joke. <laughs> <laughs> We're down to 60. I think you're almost safe. Yeah. Now I, was, I know the joke. Uh, Neil might know who I'm referring to, but I, uh, I, there's a few people I saw out there that I was happy to have muted for once. Let's wait a bit now, shall we? I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. We're still recording, Ed. Everything. I'm joking. 
including myself, believe me. Sometimes I wish I could mute myself. I, um, I think we can all feel better about the internet and Vince and Kerf, uh, you know, they, they made the internet to survive the nuclear holocaust and it's handling what's the equivalent as every uh, elementary school child <laughs> signing into Zoom at the same time. Warren, Warren, should we, um, could you uh, sort of just end this meeting and then call us in for just a quick um, wrap up? With yeah, the, we can do that. That would be great. Have you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you.